Well, I want to welcome you to our study in the Gospel of John. And as you know our practice, we never want to enter the Word of God without prayer. So let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for this opportunity you've provided for us to gather and explore your precious Word. We do pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would attend us and open our hearts and lives to your Word, that each of us may grow in grace in the knowledge of our coming King, our Lord Jesus, Yeshua himself. Amen. Well, we are indeed in a very special study. We're in session 9. It happens we're also in chapter 9 of the Gospel of John. And uh, I'm going to preface this, since we're all in a mode getting acquainted here, and there are sometimes even new people joining us, uh, to talk a little bit about Bible studies in general and how this fits in. You typically, when you study your Bible, theoretically, you'd start with what's called exegetical study. What, and that really, uh, what did the original text really say? Now, most of us take advantage, obviously, of experts that have already done that for us in, in the translations that we adopt and so forth. But the next step, and that's the one we are known for and focus, have focused on for 40 or 50 years, and that is exposition. These are, more formally, expositional studies we attempt to explore what does the text really mean. And obviously there are good scholars that have different perspectives on that, and we'll express ours and show you why we hold those views, but not with the idea of selling you our viewpoint. That's not the point. You need to come to your own points of view. We share ours just in the sense that it might be a shortcut or might be helpful. But I want to really emphasize that. Our goal is not for you to adopt our viewpoints. Our goal is to have you become what's called self-feeders to know enough about the Bible, learned enough that you have the resources and the perspective to feed yourselves on your own. And all this is intended to be helpful in that direction. Well, in the third category, after exposition, is formally called homiletics. And that really is the application. It answers the so what question, so what does it have to do with me? And often we'll we'll see a text that's very fascinating, learn some interesting things about it, but the ultimate is, okay, how does it affect our lives? And that last bridge is usually what is involved in preaching. And uh, we get preachy once in a while, but our real focus is exposition. But at the same time, uh, this chapter we're going to discover, we're going to uniquely focus on the homiletics this time. And uh, not at the expense of the others, but just as as an unusual underscoring, if you will. Now, in exposition, which is really our long suit here, That includes a number of things. It includes that we take the text very literally. That doesn't mean that we we ignore the rhetorical devices that are being employed. There are all kinds of uh, uh, rhetorical devices being employed. And another thing that causes a lot of confusion is the concept of context. In most formal seminaries, they emphasize the use of the verse in a particular context of the writer. And understanding that is obviously obviously very useful, but one it's also a pitfall because many times in the scripture we discover, and, and in fact we're taught by the scripture, that the real meaning goes far beyond the knowledge of the penman, if you will. Matthew three or four times draws examples that are really bizarre in terms of the context. They, we would think they're totally out of context. No, no, no. The context is just broader than most people realize. Your ultimate context is the whole counsel of God. There are verses that take no meaning except to the extent it's part of the total package and you need to be sensitive to that. We're going to encounter one of those in chapter 10, a little one verse that most people have no idea what it means and because they're too narrow in their point of view. And I'll show you an example of that and and what that leads to as we go. But uh, so, figures of speech, I want to emphasize there are all kinds of figures of speech. There are similes, There are allegories, there are metaphors. We use those terms rather commonly, but those each are different, by the way. There's some that you probably never have heard of, and I won't dwell on those here, but a type is a very common thing. We speak of prototypes in engineering. Well, the type is a term used in in, uh, biblical terms all over. And analogies is another one. And analogies are good for illustration, but dangerous for doctrine, because an analogy is a license to invent. And so we want to be cautious. There are figures of speech in the Bible. Anyone here know how many different kinds of particles of speech are in the Bible? Over 200. 
and they're cataloged in our materials with examples of each if you want to get into that. But the main point is taking the text literally doesn't mean you're blind to the fact that it may, an, may, may be an element of a rhetorical device, like a pun or something like that. On, on types, of course, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, all these, speaking of the Old Testament, all these things happened unto them for examples. He's talking about the, most Christians are um, almost illiterate regarding the Old Testament. Well, that's been superseded by the new. No, 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 it's not that simple. Everything in the Old Testament was there for our learning. Every detail, every number, every place of name is there deliberately. We need to understand that. They were written for our admonition to whom the ends of the world, er, world are come. And the word examples here in the translation is the word topos in the Greek, which is a figure or a pattern. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. Now, we have encountered types in our study already. Several of these we've talked about, and I won't take the time to go into them again, but the, these are all examples that are deliberately designed to teach us something. They literally happen, but they also carry an extra th uh, meta, and we've seen several of those in our previous uh, studies. So we're here exploring a field of inquiry which is known as hermeneutics, a fancy word simply meaning it's your theory of interpretation. And uh, different people will have different perspectives. As Gentiles, or being from the West, we tend to think of prophecy as a prediction and a fulfillment. That's our concept of prophecy. Here's a prediction, and here's where it was fulfilled. And there are lots of those. That's the, but I want you to understand, that's a Western model. It's true, it's valid, it's in the Scripture, but that's not the only way it communicates. That's just one way. The Hebrew way of communicating is a little differently. In the Hebrew mind, they're used, they think prophecy is pattern. They study prophecies about the nation knowing that those prophecies also apply to the Messiah in some way. They see prophecies to the Messiah that also apply to the nation. The parallel between the two is woven all through the tapestry of the Old Testament. And so we want to be, set, we want to, we want to be sensitized to the insights that come from patterns, if you will. And so they rely on patterns. That's why there's so much interplay between the nation and the Messiah, which I've just mentioned. But the uh, uh, Rabbi Hirsch was very famous for his dec declaration. The Jews' catechism is his calendar. If you go into other denominations, many denominations publish a catechism which somehow codifies their belief structure. The Jews' catechism is his calendar. It's amazing to discover how much of the Bible will get clear to you if you really understand the Jewish calendar. And so that's why we get such rich rewards from studying the feasts and so forth. The, the Feasts of Israel we have studied before, but just to refresh your memory, they're the Spring Feasts, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and Feast of First Fruits. They're in the first month of the religious year, the Nisan. The Fall Feasts are in the seventh month, and they include the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Now again, the first, the Spring Feasts all pr are predictive, they don't, only they don't only commemorate, but they also predict aspects of the first advent of Christ. And the fall feasts all predict his second advent. That's why they command so much attention today, because we get, we get clues and understa to more understanding. There's one strange one between these, the Feast of Weeks, or we call it the Feast of Pentecost, that uh, has to do with the church, and we'll talk about that more at another time. Now, Hebrew hermeneutics, also they, d they have four levels. They regard a text as having four different levels. There's the Peshat, uh, which is the literal or direct meaning. Straight, that's straightforward. They have the remez, and that's the hint of something deeper, the allegorical significance. And uh, 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 that's where you sometimes find a mystery tucked away. And uh, they have a third level they call darash. That third level is analogous to what we think of as the homiletic level, the application. It's the, the practical application of the text. And those three are somewhat prevalent in the, in the Gentile mind, but in a little different order. I'll come back to that. But the Hebrew has a fourth level that they are aware of sometimes. And that is what they call the sod, the mystical or hidden meaning. It goes really deeply in, in, a, in, a, in a much deeper sense. Now, the, uh, they remember these four levels by a mnemonic, the word pardes, which is a word that can either mean garden or paradise, depending on what vowels you assume. Those Hebrew just has the consonants, you, you imply the vowels. And part is 
can mean a garden or paradise. And the pun on that is all through the uh, Song of Songs and uh, some of the other passages. But the point is, that's the way they remember this order. Now, the order to us would be, it's a, it's, it should be a little different. We tend to think of the second and third one the other way around. You go from the d- literal uh, to the uh, uh, allegorical and then to the practical in that sense. That's moving from the text itself out to practical application. But uh, that, would, that would spoil their mnemonic, but I want you just to be aware of the four levels because we may reference from that t- some time. So, okay, there's four, uh, th- three levels that we're going to look at. Exegetical, we've talked about, exposition and homiletics, and uh, this is just by way of summary. And of course, when I say exposition, I'm talking about three dimensions to that we want to be sensitized to. How we apply the literal meaning, how we understand the use of dura- uh, rhetorical devices, and also the contextual reach that may be involved. But um, so that having been said, we've been in exposition for most of our studies in the Gospel of John. This is all by way of a warm up because we're going to shift gears here a little bit, not at the expense of exposition, but in John 9, you're going to be sensitized more and more to the deliberate intent of John that this chapter is homiletical. You and I are in the chapter in the sense of participants in the, in the imagery that's being used. And so, we're in John chapter 9. In the first eight verses, we're going to fi- find a man that was born blind. We're going to see his witness and his worship. There's three, those are the three chunks of, of uh, chapter 9. And uh, so, it was it, so, I'm going to regard this study, the hour that we're going to spend together, as a study in homiletics. Jesus claims to be the light of the world. And... Uh, in chapter 8, we have the light of the world despised and rejected, you may recall. That was last week. In chapter 9, we're gonna s- he's going to be received and worshipped. So there's going to be a contrast here. We want to understand why the difference. In chapter 8, the Jews stoop down to pick up stones. And in chapter 9, Jesus stoops down and makes some anointing clay, which incidentally was prohibited in the, in the Torah, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, In chapter 8, Jesus hides himself from the Jews. In chapter 9, he reveals himself to the blind beggar. He reveals himself to a blind beggar. We want to understand that. And in chapter 8, we have light testing human responsibility. In chapter 9, we have God's sovereign grace after human responsibility has failed. So let's jump in. After all that preamble, let's jump into um, uh, chapter 9, verse 1. And as Jesus passed by... He saw a man which was blind from his birth. Uh, The word and ties this to the previous chapter. Don't overlook that. And, so this is a linkage. It ties chapters 8 and 9 together, and we'll see some other reasons that are going to tie this to chapter 10, which is the conclusion of 9. And uh, so this is the only record in the Scripture of a person born blind. I wouldn't make too much of it, but it turns out that uh, there are more cases of blindness than any other affliction. There's only one deaf and dumb. There's one sick of the palsy. There's one sick of the fever. There's two cases of lepers. There are three that were dead raised, but there were five blind healed. So there's an emphasis by the Holy Spirit on, on the blindness. And uh, Now this one was a beggar blind from birth. I want you to visualize that. He was helpless from birth. No sight. And he... I'm going to suggest represents us because we were the natural man originally before we met Christ. We are blind from birth spiritually. And Paul emphasized that in 1 Corinthians 2 and elsewhere in a number of passages. The natural man receives not the the, the things of the Spirit because they're spiritually discerned. We need to understand a very difficult thing for most of us to really understand, but God is under no obligation to men. He simply says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And the epistle of the Romans really deals with that. And we'll talk more about that concept later. Verse 2, And his disciples ask him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Isn't that such a natural presumption? Somebody must have done something wrong. Somebody, they're looking for someone to blame. You know, that's a, that's a uh, who, who did sin? Who did sin to cause him to be born blind? His parents? Some relative? That's the question that's lurking here. 
And that echoes all through the scripture, by the way. This is actually, strangely enough, can be regarded as an echo of reincarnation. The whole idea that that some sin causes a, after and those, those beliefs originated in Babylon. You find them in the beliefs of the Persians, the Greeks, and the, and the Gnostics in the early church, and so forth. Which raises a more generic question, by the way, that I'll just throw in here for your consideration. And this list I'm going to show you is in many of our materials, but I put it in here because I felt it was appropriate. Why do Christians have trials? Okay. Well, to glorify God is one example. There's many of those in Daniel and elsewhere. It can be disciplined for a known sin. That does occasion, and, and we find that in uh, Hebrews 12 and James 4 and Romans 14 and First John's, first John's first epistle. It also, to prevent us from falling into sin. Sometimes we'll have a trial to keep us from something more serious. And First Peter talks about that. Perhaps a very common thing we need to embrace here is to keep us from pride. Often we'll have a God-allowed problem to keep us from pride. And let me give you one of the most strangest examples. It's Paul. Paul complained of what he called a thorn in the flesh. We have reason to believe it was probably his eyesight. He had an eye problem. And he prayed and prayed and prayed for that to go away. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you. That's an interesting insight because many people are exploited by ministries that argue if you're sick, it's because you don't have enough faith or something. Paul did not lack faith, and he, he had an eye problem. I, it's an interesting thing to get in perspective. God may have a purpose in what he's doing that beyond our understanding, but that's one possibility. Also to build faith. In fact, one of the most definitive works in this is the book that my wife published, Faith in the Night Seasons. There's a darkness that many people go through. That's God's way of bringing them into a unique intimacy. And Faith in the Night Seasons is a book that really develops that, if you're interested in that. You might have trials to cause growth. No pain, no gain is true in the athle athletics and it's probably true in your Christian walk also. And uh, to teach you, and I could give you examples of that, but then I'll deal, I'll re I will really derail our agenda. But uh, there were dark days that really totally changed our ministry to the good. Really dark days and they had a real direct impact in, in our commitment and our shedding of the baggage of many things we need to get rid of anyway to teach obedience and discipline, to uh, equip us to comfort others. You know, this is an interesting one. You might be going through an ordeal because God is training you to minister to people with th that are going to go through that kind of ordeal. I was very active and pro uh, high profile in the financial world. I went through a bankruptcy. Painful experience, emotionally as well as financially. And for that reason, we have ha had a calling in many places to, be f to help people who are going through that trauma. And uh, so, to prove the reality of Christ in us, it's another thing, it's a form of witness. And uh, for testimony to the angels, that may surprise you, because uh, Peter tells us that the angels are learning God's will by watching us. You know, we tend to think, because God knows everything, we think the angels know everything. No, they don't. They're learning too. Learning is that includes the modification of behavior. And angels are watching, and they're learning from us. And uh, so, uh, so it's an interesting perspective we get. I lifted these from Hal Lindsey's classic book called Combat Faith. And we use it in our Roman study, and, and it's one of, many people think of Hal as Mr. Prophecy. He's really Mr. is a number one joy is the book of Romans. But we'll move on here. So Jesus has credentials to prove that he was indeed the Messiah. Uh, Matthew makes point of that, the, the blind shall receive their sight. Remember when John sent a couple of his disciples to really check who the Messiah was? And that was one of the things, is to tell John. And he gave him a list, and that had the list, that the, the blind received their sight. That's a credential. And Jesus himself laid it out there as a credential to none less than uh, the disciples of John the Baptist. Jesus used this miracle for two things. For a short sermon on spiritual blindness that we'll encounter in verse 39, 40, and 41. And then a longer sermon on true and false shepherds that a, comp a major chunk of the next chapter, chapter 10. That's what links chapter 10 as a natural companion to chapter 9. Let's get to verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And uh, so it's interesting that uh, the works of God should be made manifest. Are there other examples? Absolutely. We're going to discover in chapter 11 the raising of Lazarus. That's pretty impressive. It's so impressive that they had to 
find a way to kill Lazarus later. But. And then Peter. His credential there, Jesus predicted the death that Peter would have as another one of his credentials. And uh, Paul, of course, thrown into the flesh I've just mentioned. And uh, we, in, we infer that that's probably an eye problem from remarks that are made in Galatians in chapter 4 and chapter 6. We get a hint as to what that was. But anyway, uh, so was this man born blind so that God could be glorified on this day is a question. Well, it's interesting because he had been blind for what, 30 years? Don't know how old he was, but he was of age, we know. So let's just make that a round guess. And so he, he went that duration in order to provide th- for this day. And that's our mission too, isn't it? Not to wait for 30 years, but to meekly submit to his sovereign pleasure. That's our, cha- that's our job. We need, to, we need to embrace that. We need to understand that's part of what's being taught here. And, uh, and to be tr- duly exercised thereby. In other words, that should have an impact on our lives. And, and the, several of the epistles deal with that. So verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Now there's a problem with this. The word isn't singular, it's plural. Your English translation has it as a singular. It turns out that the, the exegetical experts agree that the, the Greek there actually makes it plural, which includes us in the statement. We must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work. We must all be engaged in that work, is the, the real thought that's in the Greek. And of course the night makes all of mankind blind. They're all in darkness. And uh, it's interesting that uh, there's a sense of urgency. Of all the things we have, the one that's most inelastic is time. Almost anything else you can get more of. In Wall Street they say if money is your biggest problem you're in great shape. What they mean by that is money isn't everything. They usually were alluding to health, for example. But the idea, the one thing you can't add to is time. You've got to work because the night is coming. Wow. I, had a, I traveled for a while with a Jewish financier. And uh, about he was in his 50s. And I says, uh, well, Bernie, what do you got left? You got, what, maybe a thousand weekends, huh? He looked at me shocked. What do you mean a thousand weekends? So yeah, well, you're, you do your own actuarial analysis. Go to your insurance agent. You've got probably 20 years, right? There's 50 weeks a year, roughly, in round figures. That's about a thousand weekends. He sort of stunned him. Didn't th- 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 living 20 years didn't sound th- that threatening, but when you put it in weekends, it sort of rattles when you shake it. You know, it it it, it take, gets tangible. See, many years later, after a lot of other ups and downs and adventures I won't bore you with, I ran into him in an airport, and he walked up to me and says, "Hey, Chuck. Hey, hi." What is it now? About 900, huh? I knew what he meant, and he knew I knew. He, he, he was counting those days. There are just a few, the, the, there's fewer weekends left. And uh, it's, it's sort of like uh, on your girls do it in a prom. You know, they come to make a paperclip chain. How many days until the prom or Christmas or whatever, and you take, a p- take one off each day to watch it shrink down. See, our time, we can't add to it. We can't add days. David Hawking likes to emphasize all of us are going to die on time at the appointed time. So that, uh, anyway, moving on. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. This is again, this I am statement. And uh, uh, it's interesting that that in Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, that ye are all children of the light uh, and and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Most people are familiar with that passage in 1 Thessalonians 5, but they miss another point. We all say that the, 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 the Lord should come as a thief in the night. What they miss is what Paul is saying in verse 4 of that passage. Ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. The Lord comes as a thief in the night to those that are in darkness. What he's teaching here is not that we can set dates, don't misunderstand me, but the true believer will not be caught by surprise. The true believer will be living his life so when he comes, you're expecting it. Not setting dates, don't misunderstand me. When you have a high profile in this world, you discover 
that uh, the, the one of the main pains you have in this world is people that misquote you. <laughs> and I used to often say as I was getting into ministry, someday I might aspire to being misquoted as much as Chuck Smith or Hal Lindsey is. And saying, well, I think I've made that, uh, I've, re- I've achieved that particular mark of distinction. I'm the light of the world. And uh, we, I, uh, this is a place where in your notes you can go back and look at session one because we, t- we spent a great deal on the nature of light and what it has to teach us spiritually. I want to remind you that in chapter one, that flood of Noah was not the first flood. The second flood is the one that preceded what goes on in Genesis chapter one is that the darkness enveloped the ruined earth and then let there be light was the first direct quote of God in the scripture. And so the, this area of light is very fundamental. And he becomes our light even in the eternal city, in the New Jerusalem. So the concept of light has a beginning and it has a climax to us. So we need to under- get feeling. Something else uh, you'll notice in when you study Revelation, in chapter one, the disciples are portrayed as lampstands giving light. Okay, reflecting his light, of course. And it's interesting that those lampstands are very prominent in all the churches. In chapter 1 and verse 20, the lampstands are identified as representing the churches. In chapters 2 and 3 in the seven letter seven churches, they're there. What everybody misses, for lots of other reasons, we know that chapter 4, verse 1 is the rapture. But many people miss that, and what authenticates it is where are, where are the lampstands that were on the earth in chapter 1 among the churches in chapter 2 and 3 are in heaven in chapter 4 verse 1. So I just thought I'd mention that if you're perusing Revelation, which I encourage you to do, you might find that interesting. Okay, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made the clay of, made the clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind men with the clay. Now, it makes the spittle, is that with living water? That's, that term is only used, by the way, in two miracles. And uh, so, the Lord's use of the clay gets a lot of discussion, and uh, it, is, it is regarded by some of the scholars as a picture of the incarnation. Adam was made from the dust of the ground. So here's God again using the dust of the ground. That's, uh, that's the thought that they're, they're uh, uh, saying here. And uh, it also created an irritation. He took something that he then had to w- rinse out. And so it, reco- it required a step of obedience to consummate. And so they, they, th- th- that's all embodied. In now, he doesn't always use the clay. And I think that's for a lot of reasons, though, that uh, uh, he uses different techniques at different times. In verse 7, And he said unto them, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And the word Siloam means sent, by the way. That's the what translation. Which is interesting because the, the pool of Bethesda is much closer to where they were. But he sends them to Siloam. To send and to wash the Siloam. Uh, and he went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. Now this is, of course, the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, if you've been following all the other stuff. So the place is crowded with many, many visitors. So this gets a lot of communication. Now he's, he goes there, and he washes, and he now can see. It's hard for us to really grasp what he went through. Born blind, and now he can see. What a transformation. He has no idea who did it because he couldn't see who did it when he was. He's now with a different crowd and he can see. And boy, I, I, it's hard to understand the implications of that. Same thing's true of you and me. When we first see Christ, when we first really become saved, as, that, as the meaning of that sinks in, it's staggering. And... Uh, so the Pool of Siloam, okay, and that's translated Shiloh in, in some of the other passages, by the way, but that's not important. Uh, the Septuagint ampl- translates it that way. And uh, dust plus living water, so some people if you look at this as a second birth of the dust of the ground. You can make something of that if you like. But uh, he came seeing. I, I just can't get over that. And uh, healing is accomplished through obedience. If he hadn't washed the clay off, would he be able to see? Well, that's speculation, but physical sight is a step toward spiritual sight. The difference is that the beggar now knew he was blind. He knew that from the first place. That's where we are the natural man. We may not realize we're just a natural man and blind to spiritual things. But he obeyed Christ while he was blind. He was still blind when he obeyed Christ. And so... So this is us, you and me, 
put, let's put ourselves in his shoes. We are blind from birth and we are beyond the help of man. Other than Jesus Christ, there's no one that can help us. We are helpless. We need to understand that. He was. We are beggars. Have nothing. Nothing he could do. What, what occupation could he have in his culture? And uh, we are sought out by Christ. You notice he was sought out by Christ. He didn't come to Christ. Christ came to him. It's actually his sovereign grace. So, now by the way, just to notice, he, he didn't always use the clay. That was what he did there. Once Jesus healed two blind men by merely touching their eyes in, in the Gospel of Mark. He healed another blind man by putting spittle on his eyes directly. Why is he doing it differently? So that we don't confuse the method as being relevant. It's the person that's relevant. The crisis was relevant. And so, our Lord various methods lest people focus on the manner of healing and miss the message of the healing. And the message is all about a person. We're not about a religion. We're not about a movement. We're about a person. The person of Jesus Christ. So the identification's here. Throughout the rest of John 9, a growing conflict is going to emerge about two issues. The first one is, who, was this really the blind beggar? Was there a switch involved? Was it a twin brother? I, you know, those are all conjectures that would be natural in the crowd. And who caused him to see? Who caused him to see? They, that, those are two conjectures. What's going on here? So we get now into the session of the witness of the blind man. This goes from, this, from chapter 8 through 34. We're talk about his witness. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, Is not this he who sat and begged. They recognized him. They knew who he was. When the Lord touches us, it is impossible to conceal it from our neighbors. Is your conversion to the Lord Jesus Christ that conspicuous that the neighborhood knows it? You know, I usually, with my tongue in my cheek, usually congrat congratulate an audience as being the best undercover Christians that I've ever seen. The people in your family, people never, never suspect that you're a Christian. If you were on trial for being a Christian, there's not enough evidence to convict you. And I hope I'm being facetious or sarcastic. You see? So, the blind man and ourselves. He was outside the temple, alienated from God. He was blind, unable to see the Savior. He was blind from birth. That is, he's, he was estranged from the womb, to use the psalmist's term. Beyond the aid of man, helpless and hopeless, a beggar without resources, made no appeal, uttered no cry. He wasn't even asking to be healed. Didn't know it was possible. Assumed it wasn't. No human eye pities the sinner in his wretchedness. No human eye pities the sinner. Not really. Now, the Lord looked on the pity, declared the power and grace of God manifested in him. Necessarily of grace it was accomplished announced himself as the one who had the power to communicate light to, uh, to those in darkness, impressed upon the blind beggar his desperate need, pointed him to the means of blessing, and the beggar obeyed and obtained a miracle of mercy. So that pattern for him is the pattern for us. We need to understand our blindness. We need to understand our hopelessness. We need to understand that there isn't any remedy other than Christ. Verse 9. Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him, but I, he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, how were thine eyes opened? And so he, now the beggar's discovering something strange. He now can see and he thinks it's fantastic. We can get through that part of it. He's now discovering that the world is unfriendly to him. They're asking a lot, and ask, uh, a lot of questions. They're, they're assuming something phony here. They're assuming something wrong. They're they're probing in a negative sense. And so, four times in this chapter, people are going to ask, how were you healed? And they're asking that with a certain skepticism. On, in a human sense, it's understandable. But in a real sense, it's rather astonishing. And so, they shouldn't be asking how. They should translate those letters around. Who? is The key isn't how, the key is who. And that's the key that's going to come out here. Anyway, the man answered, he answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes, 
and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. So he told what he knew, as clearly as he could. A man, okay? And it's a, at least 12 times in this gospel, Jesus is called a man. And uh, that, 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 that's, a, that's a distinctive. We're going to make a big deal of the distinctives of 12 before we're through. Because there's twelve, there aren't seven I am statements. There are twelve. A close friend of mine highlighted that to me the other day, and it's very, very interesting, illuminating, because it's very classically the seven, uh, seven identities with the I am statements. But there's actually twelve I am statements, and there's twelve man statements, and twelve is the number of the kingdom, and we'll come to that another another occasion. Now the incarnation was not an illusion. We really have Christ as a man. We know Christ is God. John has really put that in front of us all the way through. But we don't want to lose sight of the fact that he wasn't only God. He was also a man. And so this is, this is emphasized here. And then said they to him, Where is he? He says, I know not. And they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. So, see, what's, what's going on here behind the scenes? People are frightened. Something's going on they can't explain, and they, th- that creates a fear. And furthermore, it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And um, so, again, Jesus is clearly upsetting and deliberately challenging the religious leadership. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him, how had he rece- received a sight? He said to them, he put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed and do see. He doesn't embroider it, doesn't embellish it, just tells it as simply as he can. And so the Sabbath day again. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. And that's pretty interesting. Not of God. You see, these guys were one-issue thinkers. Now, don't be too hard on them. We find those in many, many churches. People who organize their whole catechism around one verse rather than the whole counsel of God. And so just to be sensitive to that. And uh, all divisions are not necessarily evil because some of these took an opposition to that favorably. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? And the guy that was, the blind guy says, Well, he's a prophet. That's, if anything, an understatement. But he, 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 he He's smart enough to, re- to confront the fact that something supernatural had happened here. And uh, so he is a prophet. And uh, he's called that in several chapters already. He was worshipped. Uh, he's going to be worshipped three times in this chapter. And uh, he's the Son of God. He's the Lord. And so something about Christian witness to highlight from Luke 8. Walking faithfully in the light brings one more light. You get more light. If you're, if you're walking the light, you'll gain more light. And uh, see, the ones who will treat the young believer the worst are not the open infidels, but those who are loudest in their religious professions. And how true that is today. And uh, see, he witnessed to his friends in verses 8 through 12. He'll witness to the Pharisees in these few cha- uh, verses. And then he'll visit to, uh, witness to his family uh, between here and verse 23 and uh, then to his enemies uh, in the later part of the chapter. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. See, they're trying to turn over every rock to discredit this if they can. And they asked them, the parents, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he see? And his parents answered him and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Nor who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. <laughs> yeah, I had the same thing. You, started, you can't help but giggle with that. Uh, what are they afraid of? They're afraid of the authorities. They're not afraid of the truth, but they're just afraid of the, what the authorities are going to twist with the truth. And that's a, that's a justifiable fear. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. The Jew, and when he, now bear in mind something very important to understand about John especially. In the Gospel of John, 
John uses the phrase of the Jews, meaning the leadership. In a number of places, that's not obvious, but you need to understand that. That when he uses the term the Jews, he, it's his ascription to the leadership of the Jews. Not everyone that's Jewish. There's a, there's a, a very, very tragic misunderstanding about that that went out through the early church. The early church became very anti-Semitic. That was tragic for the Jew, of course, because the, the sins that were perpetrated under the banner of Christ are unbelievable. The Crusaders had contests of how many Jewish babies you could get on a sword in those early years. And the church became very anti-Semitic, very tragic for the Jew, of course, very tragic for the church, because that's it's through that or, uh, tradition that we've lost much of our understanding of our Jewish roots, as even as Gentiles. So, uh, but let's move on here. He is of age, <laughs> ask him. And uh, so, they feared, uh, the, the word in the Greek is the imperfect middle voice that uh, continuing, excommun- what they're talking about is excommunication. You and I cannot imagine what that means in that culture. To be forbidden to go to some uh, synagogue, to, to be excluded from the temple, to be out of the, the picture altogether. And uh, uh, ostracized by everyone. There's different forms of this. There's three forms. Some of it's a short term, some of it's longer term, and some of it even is so bad they even throw rocks at you when you're in your coffin kind of thing. Don't, make, don't confuse that with the movement of respect that they do today, different thing. Anyway, then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Now, give God the praise. They're really saying this like, stop lying. But what it formally means, it's a form of Jewish swearing in at court. You see, and so they're asking, to, you're putting him under oath because we know you're lying is the, is the flavor of it. The word actually means it's like swearing in court. And these judges, so-called judges, are prejudiced everybody from the start because we know this man's a sinner. See, if they're trying to play the role of judges, they shouldn't be prejudicing the jury, so to speak. That just uh, He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, I now see. <laughs> that sort of, <laughs> they, they can argue all their theology or legalism they want, they can't escape the reality. He was blind. He was born blind. He was, it was not a, a ruse for a few years. He was all his life blind. And now he sees. And so as we would say in America, put that in your pipe and smoke it. You know, <laughs> so now he answered and said to them, whether he be sin or not, I know not. One thing I know. You know, it's interesting. One of our favorite Bible verses is Romans 8.28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, who them, to, not everybody, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And I usually ask a class, what are the three most important words in that verse? We all know that verse. Most of us can quote it. The most important words are the first three. And, I, and we know that all things work together. For, in other words, isn't, we don't suspect, we don't hope. No, we know. There's a difference. Well, he's saying here, one thing I know what does he know? Well, first, Second Timothy 1, Paul says, we know in whom we believed. Not guessed, not suspect. No, we know whom we believed. That he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. We know that their Redeemer liveth. The earliest declaration of the resurrection is by Job in the oldest book of the Bible. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he shall uh, reign on the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Incredible statement in Job 19, oldest book of the Bible. One thing I know, they have passed from death unto life. That's in John's uh, first epistle. And one thing I know, we shall be like him. First John 3, the whole idea that we will go through a transition where we'll enjoy the same dimensionality he enjoys. That's a physics statement, actually. And so moving on. Then said they unto him again, what did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? <laughs> he answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore, would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? <laughs> you know, you can't go this far without, you know, all of you are smiling. You can't, you can't, you, you, even through the translations, you can tell he, he's, he's got them on the spot and he won't let go. And uh, he twists the, he twist the knife a little bit here, okay? Will you be his disciples? I love that. Will you also? And so, 
And that, of course, is in the, in the Greek, it's clear, it's implying a negative response. Then they reviled him. See, when logic fails, you turn to abuse and ridicule and whatever. Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. For we know that God spake unto Moses, As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. <laughs> they reviled him. And uh, the word, it, 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 it's to reproach in a louder, scolding manner, of course, abusive manner. And uh, so, now, the, the, it's amazing how many people, even today, are seeking refuge or shelter behind honored names. Well, we're a Moses disciple. And that, that, the problem here is that's been superseded a bit and they don't, they don't acknowledge it. It says, we know not, this fellow. There's an inconsistency. If you know not, then you shouldn't be judging him. They're admitting they don't know, but they don't really not know. <laughs> the man answered and said unto them, why herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. <laughs> you know, the blind man's logic is pretty inescapable here. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. See, this blind man's theology is pretty good. He's right on the mark. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. That's his logic. That's pretty straightforward stuff. And they answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? That was him. You don't seem very teachable. <laughs> and they cast him out. Now that's the thing he was fearing. They excommunicated him. Little simple, they cast him out. Big deal. That's a big deal. See, the arrogant are not teachable. That's also true today. I'm always impressed when I find a PhD in physics that comes to Christ. That's a, that, that's a, that's a double miracle. Because as anyone in academia will tell you, a PhD stands for, for phenomenally dumb. <laughs> or some people say piled higher and deeper. And I can make those remarks because I are one. <laughs> But we'll move on here. Okay. This leads us to the whole foolishness of God thing. We've already dealt with that, but I can remind you for your notes here. That, God, that the foolishness of God, and we put to naught the foolishness of men. The fool may be wise, the proud know nothing. So now we get to the final, the third f phase of this, the worship of the blind. Up till now he's been witnessing and doing a pretty good job at it. Now we'll go to the rest of the chapter, which is the worship of the blind man. When Jesus heard the man had been expelled, see now Jesus has been absent from all that dialogue, apparently, but when he's heard he's expelled, he found him. Again, Jesus is taking the initiative for the confrontation. The beggar was cast out before he knew Christ as the Son of God. Many of the Lord's people today are inside man-made systems where much of the truth of God is denied. That's a very, very difficult shoe to wear. Many people are in systems that are man-made, but within those systems, the truth of God is denied. And I won't, I, I, I won't go through the list of them, but you can make it yourself if you, don't do, do, if you just pay attention. And uh, the most tragic ones that are trapped in a system where the truth of God is denied is the people that are in, is, in Islam. Because if they try to leave, they'll be murdered. And the death penalty is usually carried out by a member of the family. Worldwide, including in the United States. So we need to have great sympathy for the Muslims. They're trapped in a system that's really very unforgiving. Others are trapped in, in uh, traditional church clothing of various kinds that are also denying the Word of God. That's a tough place to be. That's a tough place to be for a lot of reasons, all the obvious reasons. And uh, so anyway, nowhere in Scripture has God promised to honor those who dishonor Him. In every case where people are seeking the truth, Jesus reveals Himself. But where pastors are at pulpits not declaring the gospel of Christ, and the gospel of Christ is defined in the Scripture by four verses, the first four of 1 Corinthians 15. That Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scripture. That's the gospel. 
And it's amazing how far you can look to find a pulpit that really s presents that. I mean, many people accept him as a great teacher. Yeah, he even did some miracles. He's a great example. That's, n that's not the gospel. That's true, interesting, but not the gospel. He didn't disappear. He died, and he didn't just die. He fulfilled a whole list of specific specifications that were called for from the beginning of time and planned before the foundation of the world. He didn't just, and, 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 and uh, he was buried. Only Paul includes that because he builds a whole thing about baptism on that. And then he goes, and, and he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Who else has risen at all, let alone the third day, according to the scriptures? He's the man. He's the one by whom all things are going to be judged. The entire creation groans for the day. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Okay. Notice Jesus found him. It was his initiative. The good shepherd takes the initiative. And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. You know, I, I just find it flabbergasting to run into people say, Well, Jesus never said he was God. They obviously hadn't read a single page, any page, of the Gospel of John. It's everywhere. He said, And thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. The blind man worshipped the Lord Jesus Christ. Simple line, critical, crucial, in many ways. And he worshipped him. You know, it's interesting, uh, poet John Milton, he went blind, one of the greatest English poets and writers, went blind in midlife, and he composed in his work on his blindness a sonnet about coping with blindness. The work posits that those who best bear God's mild yoke, they serve him best. And uh, it's interesting that Jesus obviously allows himself to be worshipped. Peter, Paul, and Barnabas wouldn't accept worship when you read the, in the book of Acts in many occasions there. You know, the very fact that he allows himself to be worshipped is also a, 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 a credential. He makes no protest over being worshipped. He does the same thing, by the way, in the book of Joshua, end of chapter 5. Who fought the battle of Jericho? Right on. Was Jesus exactly, despite what the song sings? That song is very clever, fine, but no, Jesus, G Jesus did, and that changes everything. Every every rule of the Torah was violated in, Jer in at Jericho. But that's a whole another study, and uh, this is one of four instances where the, Jesus expressly declared his divine sonship. Okay. All right. And Jesus said, "For the, for judgment, I am come into this world, that they which see." not might see, and that they would see might be made blind. Wow. I came for judgment, and the word is crema. It's, very, it's a word very close to sifting or separate, but it's a little different. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. Ooh, ouch. Are we blind also? It's a negative construction. It implies that uh, an expecting a negative answer. We're not uh, we are not also blind, are we, is the way we would probably translate that a little more accurately. And uh, who are blind and who are healed? That's the question that should lurk in our minds as we leave the study. The arrogant, learned leadership asked, are we blind also? It wasn't the arrogant, learned leadership that was saved. And uh, the blind man ends up seeing, not just physically, but spiritually, obviously, and that's the big thing. So in our next session, when we meet again next week, I want you to read chapter 10, but i got more than that I want you to do. I also want you to, in preparation for chapter 10, read three psalms. Psalm 22, which is the Good Shepherd Psalm. Psalm 23, which is the Great Shepherd Psalm. And Psalm 24, the Chief Shepherd. The three Psalms together are known as the Shepherd Psalms. The Good, Great, and Chief. Psalm 22, 23, and 24. And we'll be talking a little bit about those as, as Jesus unfolds 
his shepherdship in the next chapter. So that'll be our preparation for next time. But as you read chapter 10, I want you to pay attention to the two hands of God. Did you know that God has two hands? They're both detailed in chapter 10. And we'll talk about that. And I'm going to want to explore how secure are you? Big debate among most people going in most churches about eternal security. Let's explore what Jesus really tells us about eternal security. It's, an, it's one of the most essential things that you're going to learn out of this whole study. And uh, with all that, let you and I bow our heads for a closing prayer. Father, we do thank you for your word and we thank you that you have healed each of us that have been born blind that we now can see, not just physically but spiritually. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit that makes us all possible. We thank you for the gift of your Son which makes it all possible. We thank you, Father, for you who have made it all possible. We do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit and through your Word, you would help each of us become more effective as witnesses, just as the blind man did, to declare your truth so that others may see. We pray, Father, we each might grow in grace in the knowledge of our coming King, our Lord, Yeshua. Indeed. Amen.